Welcome to Vision Chats, where the only thing that matters is the future. I'm Farouk Day, Vice Provost at Johns Hopkins University, and I'm excited to be having a great conversation today with someone I admi- I've admired for a long time, Harry Elam, who is the president of Occidental College. Um, Harry, it's great to see you again. You and I have spent some time together on, uh, at Stanford, and um, it's been interesting to watch your career as you've taken on the role of president uh, uh, over at Occidental College in an interesting year. February 2020 is when you were appointed. Um, and it was the year when you had to basically take on a college presidency and deal with a pandemic, social justice issues, um, the question between residential versus online learning, all with a backdrop of liberal, liberal education and um, the f- what the future would look like for that, the future of work. Now you're looking, we're all looking in higher education at the question of how to bring people to campus back and how to uh, create the sort of a new sense of normalcy. What has that been like for you this last year? And maybe what are some of the lessons learned uh, that um, uh, we, can, we can learn from you? Well, uh, the first lesson is don't become president during a pandemic, <laughs> right? No, in all seriousness, yes, it's been a, a challenging moment, but it lets us see the resilience of uh, faculty, students, uh, staff, all working together and trying to find innovative ways to solve this problem that we faced. Uh, so uh, lessons learned, there's some things I think that are going to carry over uh, uh, from remote education. Uh, So also the sense of teamwork and pulling together, that's got to carry over. And and really, you know, sort of understanding what's critical in this process of for us liberal arts education. And uh, as you know, uh, one of the things that happened was that all of these conditions sort of uh, exacerbated the things that separate us. Um, so uh, a class, a socioeconomic class evident in terms of how people could experience remote learning, you know, questions of race as black and brown people were suffering disproportionately. And then you had all that happen uh, in terms of uh, uh, George Floyd and, and the aftermath in terms of that uh, the, the sort of, that's been called moments of racial reckoning for the, the country. Um, so seeing all that, I, I mean, it happened, it, it sort of uh, was a, a time where as a, as a president, uh, we get to think about um, not only the, the, the sense of uh, the big picture of where we want to go as a college, but really thinking about what do we have to do now? And what has to happen in, in immediate. So, you know, immediate decision making. One of the immediate decisions for Ruka, as I came in, I came into the position, as you said, that was chosen in February, officially started July 1st, but started in March, basically, when it, you know, students you know, were taken off campus and trying to figure out what we were going to do. And so the first big decision was in going remote. And we decided that on July 15th. And then uh, August 12th, uh, it, it, it seemed prescient because what happened August 12th was LA County said that no school or university or ca- uh, college within LA County could have on-campus classes. So I, that, I think that was different for you all. Yeah. Did you have classes during the, this past semester? Uh, on yeah. Students. Yeah, in the spring, uh, we've allowed students who wanted to come back to uh, to return, and we've provided limited in-person services and, and interactions. Yeah, and then that became a question, is that uh, in terms of uh, what services can you, uh, uh, in terms of testing, what are we going to do, how often are we going to test, uh, and out here, out west is pretty different from, as I talked to presidents and other folks back east, and one of the things that came about in the time that uh, was, was, I think, really significant and hopefully it lasts is presidents and other people. And we're talking to each other, you know, and not, you know, uh, sort of praising their, their college or university, but really sometimes just to commiserate, commiserate over, you know, all that was going on, but pulling together. So the sense of pulling together and coalitions or finding, you know, strength in um, a communal collective activity may be something that we see also that comes out of uh, all that's happened this past year. Mm-hmm. The uh, question about online learning um, and the uh, role that it plays in higher education is not new for us. We've been right. talking about it and writing about it and dealing with it and trying to integrate it 
for years, a couple of decades, in fact. Um, but now we were forced to all together, you know, this was sort of like this national, possibly global experiment that we were forced into. Um, how did that turn out with online? What are some of the lessons that we've learned there? And is and what is the role of online learning as we move forward? Yeah, that's a, those are really good questions. And and some of it obviously is, is still unclear what it is, but uh, you know, for some, um, the idea that you could just take a class online and get a certificate at the end or get a skill is not going to leave us, you know, so certain schools are going to fill that niche. But one of the things that online learning did for us and many schools that reaffirmed the residential and the need for residential, that yeah. a different type of learning happens within that environment. But that didn't, doesn't mean that uh, there were uh, things that, that happened. Certainly, you know, when we talked about MOOCs years ago um, and thought that would be the new revolution, and it wasn't, um, uh, certainly what's happening now in terms of the online platforms that are available to professors uh, are much more sophisticated. Zoom is much more sophisticated. I mean, they, they, who didn't know knew that Zoom and Zooming would become, you know, so ubiquitous in our vocabulary as the phrase, you know, you're, you're on mute, you know, would become, like, you can't go a day without hearing it, right? So um, the, the sense of the technology's gotten better, you know, and, and, and so uh, that may be something that lasts. Uh, so one of the things that, uh, that I've seen within that is uh, um, uh, trying to be innovative by, by liberal arts education standards of faculty so that uh, breakout sessions and really using that uh, platform has been really helpful and a way to have conversations. And I've heard even some um, uh, professors say that they can get better interaction because they can see the class all on the screen in a different way. Um, and uh, so that connection. So the idea of really uh, using the platform and technology in ways that improve pedagogy or impact it is something that will last. Uh, another thing that has been interesting is office hours. Uh, I have had professors talk about the fact that uh, students have felt and sometimes more comfortable or more willing to come to office hours if it's online remote that they've got a time and they, they know it's you and the professor and the student working together at that time. And so it may be more productive in terms of office hours. Uh, finally, I guess, I guess what I'd add is, is that um, uh, there were certain things that, uh, that really, I guess, were um, uh, happy, I wouldn't say accidents, but happy in innovations that came out of, of that, um, that um, when you know that the student has to be remote, can't interact with the way, what can you create? We had uh, um, interesting work happening uh, in the, what we called Occidental Immersives, and they were courses for first-year students that considered, um, that uh, had an uh, experiential component to them. So there was one in art, that they, over the course of the semester, took uh, different branches of art that intersected in areas of the performance as well as in visual art. And then at the end, they had, wherever they were, and or also in LA, they had an internship with an artist within that area. So the sense of really finding other ways to work um, was something that happened through the, uh, the period of, or continues to happen as you know, we go with technology. Because the simple fact is Zoom is not going away. Ah, let me add one more thing. Uh, professors found that they could um, have visitors, you know, and it was easier in a sense. I could call you up and say, Farouk, you know, would you come to my class here? And, and, you, and you don't have to fly. You just have to, you know, Zoom uh, to get there. So that's something else that we saw happen. And that's going to continue, I'm sure. Yeah, that does a, a really good service to the university from the perspective of alumni engagement, especially as um, in addition to community engagement and corporate mm -hmm. engagement, having um, we've always wrestled with the idea of how do we engage alumni more. And I think that this has opened that up for us. Uh, we had a, a faculty um, at Hopkins who created group uh, office hours in addition to the individual office hours. Um, and that's to, uh, to, to make up for the community uh, development aspect. And um, another one who teaches writing um, had quiet office hours, uh, quiet Zoom rooms, 
uh, where people just can come log in, be on camera or off camera, mute or not mute. They play some music in the background uh, in the Zoom room and then just let them write. Uh, and it's to make, I think that it was called Writing Cafe or something like that. Um, so there are so many innovations that we were forced into. Mm-hmm. Is there a worry that we lose all of that as we start to go back um, mm-hmm. beyond the pandemic? I think there's, there, you're right. There's some worry. I mean, what, uh, but I, I, as I said, with, with the uh, professors and visiting classes, you know, something's going to stick and it, it, and, and uh, it depends on professors and us reinforcing, you know, the message that, that uh, you you still have the kind of IT support that's going to enable exercises like that. I love that idea of the Zoom uh, or the the writing room. Um, yeah. What a great as, as students sometimes probably feel that that it's hard, you know, to keep to have the the place to write at home or in the library. I mean, here it can be collective and communal without being. Um, uh, my my daughter when she was working on her honors thesis went to and I give her credit. For this, she went every Saturday morning from nine to twelve to a writing boot camp. You know where you yeah. were around. So this was a virtual one, which I, I think is such a great idea. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna bring that back. <laughs> sure, for, use it definitely. And uh, there are so many innovations from so many universities and colleges. Um, and it's interesting. I think the theme behind it, it was community for me. Is that that mm. that was what Zoom could not uh, make up for. That's why we were uh, missing the residential experiences because we, while we were becoming more efficient and effective uh, at our work. I mean, in in my own area, I've seen just some of our highest numbers of engagement, et cetera, and where it's easier to engage alumni and to to uh, uh, to grow, foster mentoring um, uh, relationships. But the community has been uh, aspect has been really hard because there's something um, there's ser- serendipity in that um, yeah. that the yeah. residential campus uh, creates. I always said during this last year that the technology that can figure out how to create that sense of community online will probably make a lot of money. Like I feel like that's been just the missing link mm-hmm. this entire um, um, this entire time. Um, so um, how did that affect also university budgets and enrollment and strategies? And like, what were some of the risks that were at play? And as we look into the future, there was the question that we've been hearing, you and I and others, for years and decades. Um, and it always comes up and we always answer it, yes, it, it is worth it. Is college education um, worth it at the, at the cost um, that, uh, that we see? And are there other cheaper solutions? And was this the year to finally get that, that question in front of uh, uh, everyone? And what's the answer for that? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a great question. And, and, and it's the key that is, as we think about going forward. You know, we suffered a significant uh, drop in revenue as a result of the, the pandemic. Or you saw the students not, uh, um, or deciding to take time off, or, or not being on campus. Uh, normally, we have a, a, a small number of students who decide to take a gap year in the first year, but that number escalated, and uh, uh, as it did at many places. And so, for us, small liberal arts question, college was a question of: Are those students going to come back? Uh, and and what or what's bringing them back, uh, or the the idea that we you know, that they may want to go instead of coming in uh, out to Oxy, uh, they may want to stay closer to home, or that they can take a course like you taught remotely at uh, a, you know a community college or uh, remotely online, you know, from one of the many people who do that. Um, and so that was a threat that we wouldn't you know, yield back our students from the, the, those who went. But we, we were wrong. And I think it relates to what you said earlier about uh, uh, the community. Um, the students, uh, so uh, the, uh, 90% of those students have come back. And so we have, a, uh, you know, that those students coming into this year's first year class. Um, and, and that's uh, um, in, in important. Uh, but uh, the, the sense of, um, you ask about in, in, in terms of the model or finance or of value is still um, at, at, at question. Um, and I think, I mean, one of the things that in, in your work on this has been critical um, is that tying the fact that to 
it's seeing, you know, the practical work, seeing jobs, seeing um, that connection is not antithetical to a liberal arts education, but seeing a critical component of a liberal arts education. So practical internships, other things that we have available, those things, they are, you know, they come to the surface uh, all the more so, I think, uh, it, 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 as we go forward. Um, and that becomes uh, a, a critical part of our strategic planning. How do we, you know, how do we make the practical? We, uh, I mean, we have a number of courses that have practical components that, that are working, students working in uh, urban areas or working in LA, you know, and taking advantage of it. We have a uh, music production is a growing major. And one of the cool things about doing music production at Oxy is that you're in LA and have the potential and so people can see that connection to the other side in terms of work. Um, and so that's really, really important. Um, the, the notion, uh, last thing I did and answer, uh, the notion that, um, uh, as I said, of students coming back and the financial uh, picture of that um, you know, it, uh, is one that, uh, as I said, that, that uh, the, the sense of um, finding community is one we're going to really have to uh, find ways to generate. You know, it, it relates perfectly to what you said. It wasn't happening online, but still it's got to be orchestrated here because we've got first year students never been on campus. Sophomores never been on campus. Juniors you know, one semester or not even that on campus. So we've got this whole coming back, a, a, a group of people, you know, who've been loyal to or care about Oxy, but really haven't been here. You know, so how we orchestrate that and how we relate that to what you talk, we've been talking about in terms of jobs and practice is all part of the process that uh, the next uh, year and beyond is going to be about. You know, the, this is a point that I've been wrestling with for a long time, uh, is that the idea of integrating practical experience and immersive experiences that give students skills that complement their education in the classroom. Um, I think what's also tied to that is the, you know, when, when we immerse them in those experiences, they also get connections and relationships, meaningful relationships that can help open doors for them. Uh, but I always hear about it in higher education, including my institution included, and we've been trying to do better, better there. I hear about it as initiatives, as add-ons to courses and things like that, rather than systematic, that it's a, a systematic uh, change in the entire, let's say, curriculum uh, or in the entire student experience. And the difference be the, between the two is meaningful to the point that it can make a difference for especially those of underrepresented backgrounds. Um, I've always felt that there were plenty of practical experiences and immersive experiences in the college um, uh, experience, but it's those with the navigational skills um, and with the board of advisors, if you will, in their own families and their neighborhoods that seem to find those experiences, whether it's a study abroad or an internship or um, some type of practical experience on campus uh, in taking advantage of all those resources. And then those who are the first generation, for example, or those who have other additional constraints, they tend to miss out on them then really hear about them in a meaningful way after they graduate. We often hear alums who say, I wish I could go back and take advantage of all of those resources uh, when I was a, which I didn't when I was a student. At what point do we get as a higher education field and industry, do we get to a point where we actually systematically change the college experience so that every single student gets engaged in these experiences and these connections regardless of their background or social capital, regardless of who they are? See, uh, great question. You are and have been one of the leaders in this and, uh, and nationally in terms of thinking about this. And I think it's really, really important. And what you've done and what you know, we, we do and we'll look to continue to do here is really look to integrate what happens in a career center um, is not 
as something, you know, add on or something, you know, that's in a corner, corner of the campus that if you get lost, whatever you run into and, and might find, you know, that, or that, you, you know, they put on a fair and that's it, um, you know, work fair. I mean, it's got to be system, systematically part of the whole of the, you know, of organically part of the, what happens in terms of uh, undergraduate or uh, education uh, so that it is part of the experience for everybody. Um, so what does that mean? That, that means that uh, uh, here, um, uh, the Hamid Bin Career Center reports to academic affairs and, and also dotted line to me um, because of that, that sense that, that you know, what happens there is important. Um, that something you tried at, at, at Stanford and you know, is something that I inherited here and we'll, we'll build on is that we want people involved when they come in as first year students mm -hmm. with careers, not something, you know, at the last minute, they're trying to find a job as senior year. So it's a process that, that, you know, what's going to learn, lead to an internship. What does that internship say about, you know, what you might want to do later and, or, or not want to do as a result of the internship? How do you think about the, um, the prospects of uh, you know, preparing for a job market? How does that relate to things that you're critical thinking that comes through the skills that you're learning in the classroom? Uh, how does the classroom in, in any way make it uh, add possible to, for further amplification of what you're saying as you go out into the world um, uh, in, in terms of uh, what you uh, do outside of class or the experiential components of the class? So there's a real space for that to happen. I think it has to happen. And, and so one of the things that big picture questions that we're going to be looking at is, is how do we rethink uh, uh, liberal education for the 21st century. And what does that mean uh, about how we think about uh, the organization of the curriculum? And to me, the practical part of that that has to be for all students um, part of it. So last thing on this uh, is advising. It, it makes mm -hmm. advising all the more important in terms of that. So uh, students become aware of opportunities or there's programs that help. So um, you, uh, for students from under-resourced backgrounds, students from underrepresented backgrounds coming into the space, they're not, they may not know about the advantages that you right. talked about. How do we even that playing field? Um, uh, so we have a program, the Multicultural Summer Institute, which is four weeks. Uh, there was a program, as you know, at, at Stanford, the Leland Scholars Program, which is four right. weeks that helps push, uh, um, acclimate students to the college environment. Um, what doesn't happen in those programs is you can't make up in four weeks for four years of high school, you know, so, so what had needs to be a sustaining thing within systemic, as you suggest, within the curriculum and when they're the thinking about what is liberal arts. And that's going to be, I mean, I think we're going to see some of that change and, and that's going to be exciting to see in terms of the future. I think so. And especially as the world of work is changing right now and also higher education is changing as a result mm -hmm. of this, uh, this pandemic. And as we go back to creating a new normal, I think that these are so going to be some of the norms that uh, we'll create. You know, one of one of our themes at Johns Hopkins in trying to deal with this, and we, we did that since day one, since I, uh, I joined, is that we can't treat this as a question of career outcomes. We have to treat it as an equity question. And if we deal with it as an equity question, it just changes everything else that we do from the organizational design to the metrics that we collect to how and how we interpret those metrics in, in terms of success uh, to the narrative that we create. And then it, it comes all the way down to the people we hire um, and how we integrate all of those approaches. Uh, once we did that, we started to lead in a different direction and a different, you know, so we're all of my teams and all, my entire organization throughout my, uh, uh, all of our nine schools at Johns Hopkins, we're leading with, with that mindset that this is about equity rather than about um, just the aggregate outcomes for the university. I, I think that sounds great. Can you give me a, uh, give me a concrete example of how that uh, worked in terms of leading with equity? So, for example, when we measure uh, where students go after they graduate, it's not about the aggregate numbers of where they, that they go and how much money they make. We actually measure 
the uh, gaps between different groups of students, first generation and non-first generation uh, graduates, those who have limited them income backgrounds, or those on Pell Grants versus not. And uh, we've identified gaps and they are there and um, uh, just as expected. So, but yeah, they can't be seen in aggregate numbers that an institution can be proud of and put mm -hmm. on an infographic uh, or an admissions brochure. Um, and then we use those to go back and then just attack those uh, directly. So for example, in our first year of implementing that, that, that dashboard, we found a $24,000 gap in first salary between underrepresented minorities versus not. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, you know, that can't be just because- This is regardless of major. I was going to say this is exactly, but this is this, when you have a gap this big, it's not because some are in computer science versus not. Like this, the, the gap is just too wide. Um, and now it comes down to um, why, you know? So what is it about the students' backgrounds that make them take the first offer or not negotiate or uh, versus others they, they are looking for, you know, why is it that some students are looking for jobs and others are looking to pursue their life purpose and their mission in life, you know? And, and I think then it comes back then to how we engage students on an everyday basis. So, and then we've been able to create, for example, for our undergrads, an entire team that we've named SOAR, um, it's a seven person team that is entirely focused on providing uh, underrepresented students with um, immersive experiences, mentoring connections, um, and um, uh, 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 life design strategies, et cetera, to try to, to close these gaps. So that's one way to, to, that, that we're trying to tackle this. Uh, but again, it just comes back to how do we approach this from the beginning? And so we've turned our entire organization to be about equity. We're really a DEI organization rather than a, mm -hmm. an integrative learning or life design organization. And that's, that's made all the difference. So I feel like that's, those are the questions that need to be, uh, uh, to be thought of um, mm -hmm. as we move forward in, in higher education. Since we're talking about DEI, do you, um, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, social justice and um uh, the reckoning we had to face this year. And I think it connected a little bit to the pandemic because we were all forced um, in our homes or most of us were forced in our homes in front of our computers to watch the, the murder of a, of a, a black man um, for uh, nine minutes and uh, I think 26 seconds. Um, it's, it's nothing new, unfortunately. All these things have been happening for years, but this was the first time that the whole nation, the world had to sit world. down and and, and watch it. And I think that's related to the pandemic. What has that done for higher education and how are we tackling these questions differently from before uh, the, the day George Floyd um, uh, passed away and from before the pandemic? It's been somebody, it's something that every college and university has had or needs to have put on the front burner. It may have been on the back burner, maybe, in, you know, th these are issues that, uh, uh, we're being called to really um, attack and see how they make a difference. And we should be a model for society in terms of shaping how society thinks about these issues. Uh, I mean, that's the role of, of higher education, to prepare our students to go out and lead and to make a difference as global citizens. Um, I, I, your notion of leading with equity is, 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 is critical. So um, what I developed, we developed here was uh, an equity and justice agenda. And it's an aspirational document. It's a living document that lays out things that we want to do as a college. But I mean, the, the, the sense is, is that these are not things that are separate from the, uh, the overall mission of the college, which is about social justice, but also about academic excellence. They are things that inform that, you know, diversity and equity have to be a part of everything that we do to be the kind of college we want to be for the future. And that's where we're going or thinking about in, in terms of mindset with us. Um, I'm fortunate that uh, these are things that are the, the trustees are thinking about and, and concerned with as well as their role. Um, and how do we be uh, an, an organization, a, a school that's concerned about um, equity and, and justice. So our trustees board has a subcommittee on diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. Um, that is working with and thinking about those sort of questions and how it's going to impact all the work 
that happens um, with uh, the trustees. Uh, but um, I, I, the schools haven't been able to avoid it, it and shouldn't be able to avoid it, 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 but need to think about it consciously. What does this mean to our institution and how is our institution going to be better at dealing? What does it mean in terms of faculty? you know, and the diversity of our faculty and the retention of our faculty. What does it mean in terms of retention of students and the diversity of the student or the experience of the students that you talked about, you know, so that uh, students of, uh, uh, from underrepresented backgrounds really have the support they need, not just to survive at the institution, but to thrive. So that's, I mean, that is, is really pushing at us to be, you know, the best college universities we can possibly be to think through really what that means because we're going to be more diverse in the future and 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 how do we really use that as a to an advantage that's going to make our institution all that shine in the ways that we want it to uh i would say um that what's the outside pressure has been interesting on that um so we've got a president of the united states talking about systemic racism when did that happen before that's the that outside pressure pushing at, at colleges and universities to, to be different. So outside as well um, in things like uh, in, endowment management are asking questions about, are we investing in funds that have social impact? Are we investing in companies that have managers that are either women or people of color? You know, so or same thing. So businesses coming to the school are being asked that, you know, if we're going to have a contract to you, are you representative, you know, of the country or, or the way L.A. looks or in terms of who you employ? So it's, it's a massive uh, and important moment in terms of uh, thinking about these issues of racism in ways potentially that have not And we have to seize the opportunity. And it, I think as we do, it's going to make us a better institution. Yeah, and I, I, I agree with that. And I think that the, the, the challenge as I, I look just at higher education in general is to, to do things that like the ones you're, what you're just mentioning, uh, to move us from statements of values, uh, which are important, and from um, uh, the phase of having conversations about race and social justice, which are valuable, I think was, you know, that, that's precisely what we need to do in college campuses, mm -hmm. to actual concrete action um, um, and to action that can actually be even inconvenient for colleges at times. Just, you know, like the, the, the investment or divestment question that, that, that you shared, um, even just looking at our curriculum and um, are we integrating social justice um, into our curriculum or, to, or teaching from that perspective, um, the experiences that we have. I know that, that every college has uh, compositional diversity, for example, as a very important element uh, or a metric that's for students and faculty and staff. And it's an area that a lot of colleges struggle with. And ultimately, that's one of the, the goals that we should, we should have is to increase that compositional diversity. But to do that, we have to change the climate in general mm -hmm. in order to be able to, to attract uh, more students, faculty, and, and staff uh, uh, of color or of diverse backgrounds. Um, on the faculty side, that's always a challenge is to increase the... Um, um, the size of uh, or the percentage of our um, uh, underrepresented communities and in, um, um, in, in our faculty ranks. I'm, I'm not sure if there are some strategies that you've used uh, or you're looking into at Occidental. I know that cluster hiring, for example, is, uh, um, is a method that's taken off now uh, on a lot of college campuses. Um, uh, but, but that's an important one for students to be able to see themselves in the faculty member. Um, are there things that you've seen either there or at other colleges that, that could be helpful? Yeah, the, the thing you just mentioned, cluster hires. Yeah, I think that's an important step. We're, we're going to do that. Uh, Black Studies at uh, Occidental is now a department. It's something students wanted to have happen. And, and, and faculty actually uh, uh, wanted it to happen, too. And we're supportive of Black Studies as a department. Uh, 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 there's an endowment that is uh, um, uh, for the chair in Black Studies. But cluster hires bringing together uh, yeah, people who share an interest and that's going to, or a, a thematic connection in terms of their scholarship and that's going to inform the work. So that, that's been um, important. Uh, 
Also, um, the, the sense of uh, what we're looking for uh, is um, in other fields. Um, one of the things that's been interesting to happen is this, for those fields to look at, uh, and, and this happened actually uh, post uh, George Floyd, the departments in terms of the statements they put out, you know, how everybody put out a statement uh, of feeling uh, empathy, but also support for um, uh but the question is, when you just ask, what are you going to do? Uh, and what does this mean in, in con uh, concrete in terms of the curriculum? So departments across the board, and here I'm emphasizing you know, departments like chemistry or physics, seemingly, you know, are, are not dealing with questions of, of social justice, but they are, you know. And uh, so how do you find a way and how do you open up a conversation about what that department is doing in terms of how not only, you know, what it's teaching, how it teaches, and, and, and what it tries to reach. Uh, uh, one of the people doing basic chemistry at uh, OXY makes the point of using examples from real life in the work that have, you know, social justice themes. So she talks about Flint, Michigan, and the water and the crisis there and thinking about chemistry. And so that opens up the subject in a different way, but it opens it up to social justice in a, in a way that's informing sustainability. It's another key issue that, that happens in, in, in terms of that uh, way. So um, how we think differently about the curriculum and, uh, and the willingness of the uh, uh, departments to do that, that's part of the project of uh, changing the cultural climate. Um, it's going to be tough in, in terms of, you know, of, of uh, diversity in, the, in terms of the faculty because everybody... Everybody, as you say, is, is looking, everybody's trying to do this. So people are trying to, and, and there's a finite number of faculty of, of, of color, unfortunately, right now. So another thing we've got to do is increase the pipeline. You know, so uh, your school, other schools have uh, programs with uh, Mellon Mays um, uh, that have helped to, to increase it. And, and there's other programs along the way that are looking really uh, to, to do that, to find ways to get uh, students, more students of color going on and getting a PhD. So, you know, we widen, particularly in the terms of sciences, the, uh, the pool. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, um, Harry, in the last couple of minutes uh, we have together, I, I want to ask you, how on earth did you find yourself from um, uh, starting in the, in the arts um, um, and pursuing uh, a degree in, uh, in, in drama, I think, uh, to uh, becoming a president of a uh, liberal arts college? And how, so if you could share a little bit about how your own life and your career has uh, 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 progressed over the years and what, what were some of the pivotal mo uh, moments in your life that sure. led you to where you are today? Yeah, I mean, in, uh, in, in my thinking, it's all interrelated. Uh, so the things that have driven me from the beginning, issues of interest in theater and performance, uh, social justice, education, uh, all of them have... Uh, have come together. Um, and so as a kid, um, my, my father was the chief justice of the Boston Municipal Court. Um, and uh, my mother was in charge of the libraries for the cities of Boston. And both of them cared deeply about education, but also about uh, the idea of social justice. My father started an organization to help keep black and brown boys from appearing before him in court. And my mother made sure that students within uh, the Boston schools had books written by and about people that looked like them. Um, so that sense was there from the beginning. And, and from the beginning, I, I was involved. Uh, we started a youth drama group called The Family. And The Family uh, was consisted of uh, plays in the, in that uh, were revolutionary in consciousness about the Black experience. So that was something that I did on the side. Um, uh, and by my parents, I was fortunate in Boston, the schools, but public schools were really bad at that point and really segregated. Um, I went to school with all black students, but a white teacher. And it was a white teacher that uh, said to my mother, you got to get him out of here and send him to another school. He's not. And, and think of all the school students who didn't have that opportunity. You know, so I got to go to private school um, and, uh, you know, did the drama with the family as, as part of that experience. Got to college at Harvard where I thought I was going to be a lawyer like my father and uh, found out that the only thing that excited me about law was the drama of the courtroom. So 
then go on then uh, went to, to Berkeley to get a PhD in drama. And it was there um, that uh, what I wrote about um, and studied was the theater for social change. What about a play can make people think and potentially act? And uh, what happened in California was, was fascinating. You know, my experience had all been in black theater, but I uh, got excited about and got involved with Chicano theater uh, and saw the parallels that were happening with Chicano theater in the 60s and African and black theater in the 60s at the same time. So Chicano theater around Cesar Chavez and the great paper, paper strike. So that sense of, you know, the power of performance has driven me. Um, and uh, I directed plays there and I directed uh, uh, plays subsequently professionally, but, you know, wrote about the social theater, social protest theater. So finally, you know, I, I'd been at Stanford uh, for 30 years before coming um, uh, the president of uh, Occidental. And what uh, it drove me as a scholar is that question that I asked before, well, what's the power of theater? And, and to think about it, to write a book on uh, artists like uh, uh, August Wilson, who believed strongly in, in the sense that theater could uh, be a, a social force in people's lives and to uh, really think about that. But um, also I directed his work and directing to me has been a lot like is it's been uh, a, my model for leadership. So in terms of uh, as a stage director, what you're trying to do is you're trying to make everybody's work better uh, and to give their best possible to self. So enable them to do their best work, to provide an environment that's conducive to that. And that has to happen as a president. You're trying to make it a, a conducive environment for your professors to do their work, for students to thrive. So that's part of that. Um, and uh, you all are working together in a play towards a common end, which is the, the show must go on uh, towards that show. So in the same way, leadership is trying in, in a university or college, uh, trying to get everybody to work together towards that common vision, mission of the institution. So for me, um, I'm still uh, a theater director and uh, th that sense of that was, there's no better um, practice or no better experience to help me now as a, uh, as an administrator and a uh, person in charge of the, the institution than being in charge of the theater. Last thing on this is that the theater taught me a lesson that, uh, that I really think is important on a daily basis as a president. And that is that it's not just about leading, it's about being in service. And so, um, serving your faculty, serving students, you know, a student in need who comes to, to talk to me about a problem they're having is really part of the job as well as, you know, leading the institution as, as a vision. So you've got to um, lead and serve and the things they come together. So, you know, I, I, I welcome the opportunity to come to a place like Occidental because Occidental is, is committed to social justice. Um, uh, it's uh, in its foundation of principles are diversity and community and service and ex academic excellence. So all of that excited me about this possibility and, uh, and really um, still uh, keeping an interest in and concern about the power of the arts as well. Long answer to your question. That's a fantastic answer. The show must go on is uh, <laughs> a, a great takeaway from this in leadership and um, uh, they absolutely picked the right leader for uh, for this uh, uh, important job. Uh, so I'm, I'm so happy for them and for you. Harry, during our time at Stanford, you were the one I looked up to. Um, and I always uh, admired the way you lead uh, with humor, with humanity and with heart. Uh, and I'll, I'll watch that from afar and also from our um, uh, many interactions we've had. And I love watching what you're doing from afar there. Um, and uh, I can't wait to see what, what you do next. It's been a fascinating conversation today. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. And take it. Good luck with your work. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And everyone, the only vision that matters is the one that you create. Thank you for joining us. And thank you again, Harry. Bye-bye. Thank you.